Good morning, and you're very welcome here to Ballyhome Presbyterian Church as we continue to celebrate the birth of Jesus on this Boxing Morning. I hope that you had a lovely day yesterday, and I pray that you also will have a lovely time sharing with us in worship this morning. Just before we do so, a couple of announcements. First of all, our service next Sunday will be at 11 a.m., and that will be in person here in the church. And then on behalf of Heather, myself, and our girls, Kim and Zoe, we want to wish each of you in your homes a very, very happy new year. And we pray that 2022 will be a year of joy and blessing for you. And then it is with regret that I refer to the death during the past week of Mrs. Margaret McMeekin. Margaret was a very familiar face around our congregation and many, many people thought very, very highly of her. She was a familiar face at the Bulls, at PW, and also at New Horizons. And she'll be missed here. And we want to extend our sympathy to her family, particularly to her daughter, Kathleen, and to her grandchildren, Alison, Roy, and Stuart, and their families. And I would ask you now if you would join with me in a moment's silence as we pay our respects to Margaret and then I will lead us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, today we want to thank you for Margaret's long life and all that she contributed to the life of our congregation. We thank you that she was a very familiar face around this place and was here every Sunday at worship. Father, we, we mourn her passing today and we pray particularly for her family, for Kathleen and for her grandchildren, Alison, Roy and Stuart and their families, praying that you will be near to them at this time of loss and sadness. Lord, comfort them, be near to them and help them as they prepare themselves for the funeral service at the end of this week. May they know your hope, the hope of Jesus Christ, the hope of the Christ child born in Bethlehem, and may it bring them reassurance and comfort. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Margaret's funeral will be in Grace Funeral Parlour on Friday the 31st of December. Now, this morning, we do continue to give thanks and praise to God for the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. And today we're going to do so by looking at a particular verse in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son sent from the Father, full of grace and truth. And that idea of Jesus coming to earth is found in our opening song this morning as we share together in Once in Royal David's City.
together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come here today to return once again at this Christmas time to worship you and give you the praise and honour of which you are worthy. For when it came to the fullest expression of your love, when the moment came for you to demonstrate what you're really like, you gave your Son, your only Son, Lord Jesus, this morning we praise your name for the obedience that you showed to God the Father. You did not consider equality with God something to be clung to. Rather, you humbled yourself and set aside the majesty of heaven for the vulnerability and weakness of a newborn child. Rather than overseeing what you had made, you entered into it and placed yourself totally reliant upon a young girl for all your needs, so that you could become a true representative of us all. Holy Spirit, through you the birth of Bethlehem took place. By your power and authority, these events took place. And so, Father, Son, and Spirit, we worship you for this wonderful event a key moment in your great plan of salvation for the world. We're sorry that it was due to us, to me, that it became necessary for such actions. But we are so grateful that you took them. We pray that today you would hear us and see our hearts as we turn away from everything about us that's wrong. We lay it all before you, and as we release it, we pray that you would sweep it all away as far as the east is from the west. Thank you for giving us a great rescuer. We pray that you will be with us as we worship in the aftermath of Christmas and in the midst of trying days. Help us to look beyond ourselves, above our circumstances, and to see you in a way that we can lean upon you for all our needs. Teach us today about the role of Jesus and how he entered this world, and lead us to find in him our soul's contentment. May you bless our service of worship and make it a joy to you. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're going to sing again, and our second song is Joy to the World.
And so our reading is taken from John chapter 1, reading from verse 1 through to verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. And we pray that God will add his blessing to this reading from his word. Just before we think about it, we're going to have our third song, and it is Love Came Down at Christmas.
I remember in November 1995 when President Bill Clinton visited Northern Ireland. He'd come to support the emerging peace process. Up until then, the President of the United States only seemed to visit really important places in the world with major things going on, which at that time felt like anywhere else but Northern Ireland. And yet there was Air Force One at Belfast International, the presidential convoy going along Sydenham Bypass, the Secret Service talking up their sleeves, Bill Clinton standing in front of the City Hall speaking with the podium with the presidential seal on it. You only ever saw that on major international news or in big Hollywood films. Suddenly it felt like we were important, that he would come here and walk on our streets, which for decades no one else wanted to walk on. His visit really meant something, and it helped to contribute towards the ending of much of the violence that had blighted Northern Ireland for decades. When you think about Jesus Christ coming and walking on the earth, what comes into your mind? Because he, he walked in our shoes. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This is the most, the most remarkable statement ever committed to paper in what it says and in the implications that come out of it. When we talk about someone walking in our shoes, we mean that they've fully entered into our experience of life. They've followed my footsteps, kept the appointments that I've kept, faced the things that I've faced. And we see how God has come to us in Jesus when we ask a few questions of this amazing statement. First of all, who walked in my shoes? Well, the word became flesh. In John 1, it's obvious that when he refers to this character whom he calls the Word, he's talking about Jesus. He calls him the Word because he came not to deliver a message. Rather, he calls him the Word because he was the message. Jesus is what God wants to say to us, translated into our language in a way that we can understand. People who came into contact with Jesus, who looked at him, and listened to him, acknowledged this. Matthew 7, following the Sermon on the Mount. The crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Matthew 16, Peter's great confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mark 15, the centurion in front of Jesus' cross who said, surely this man was the Son of God. Even the sceptics down through the years, even if they've wondered about Jesus' existence and divinity, still don't deny his character, the words that he spoke, the things that he did. He stands apart from the rest of humanity, different, with qualities that are higher, purer, holy. But John sees someone more than who did good things. He's God outside the confines of the Hebrew, Aramaic or Greek languages. God has spoken universally through him in human. In his first letter, John would write about Jesus, saying, which Jesus, whom we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. At the end of his gospel, John wrote explicitly what he was seeking to communicate. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He wants us to know that Jesus has walked where we walk. Secondly, how did he walk? Well, the word became flesh. That's a strong, raw expression of Jesus' humanity. He embraced human life. He went through everything that being human means. Sickness, joy, hunger, bereavement, sleepless nights, excitement. And he didn't play at it like an actor entering into some kind of Jesus character. He really lived it. When he fell as a child, he would have howled from the pain. When, he did some, when someone did something funny, he would have laughed. When he came up, uh, had ideas in his mind, he shared them. And he really would have enjoyed a good meal with his friends. And this is where we meet one of the mysteries of the incarnation. Jesus was fully human, and at the very same time, he was fully God. 
not like some kind of hybrid car blending fuel and electric, but neither fully fuel or fully electric. Jesus was both fully man and fully God. Just like the suit I once bought and didn't like. It was too blue to be grey and too grey to be blue. And because it was neither one or the other, I hardly ever wore it. But Colossians 2.9 says, In Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Before Jesus came, people could only know God partially. After Jesus came, they could know God fully. John 14, if you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Jesus was a tangible, visible, in his nature, God, visible for all to see. You could touch him, talk to him, hear him. And ever since, by his Holy Spirit, we've continued to. This means Jesus could fully represent us as humans and fully forgive us as God. It means that when we turn to him, he knows. Thirdly, where did he walk? He made his dwelling among us. He walked here on the ground, breathing our air, eating our food, feeling the warmth of our sun and the cold of the winter's day. He did it here on earth, in Israel, in towns and villages, in full view of many people in history, with real events and real locations and real people being named. The word John used for made his dwelling is closely linked with another Greek word that has the meaning of a tent or tabernacle. And for John's Jewish readers, that rang powerful bells. The tent of meeting or the tabernacle was the structure that you see appearing early in the Old Testament at the beginning of the Exodus after the Israelites left Egypt and that continued with them until David built the temple some 280 years later. It held the Ark of the Covenant, and it was where the people understood God's presence resided on earth. Exodus 40, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Just as God was among his people in the tabernacle in the wilderness, so he was with them through Jesus in a clearer way. There was no symbolism to try and understand what Jesus was. That was God. He knew what it was like trying to meet ends meet. He understood peer pressure to go with the flow and do what everyone else was doing. He knew how wonderful it is to laugh and how terrible pain is. And he showed what it was like when God had to deal with these things. John says we saw his glory, not a lofty, unapproachable glory, but the kind that lets children climb on his knee or entered into a debate over his actions, how they were to be understood, or let him be challenged and even rejected to his face. A glory that in the end saw him humiliated on a cross. That's not the way we understand glory. We see it in displays of power, with the trappings of wealth and the symbols of grandeur. John is telling us from witnessing it himself, that God's glory was seen in small, unfussy acts, healing the sick, teaching people, feeding the hungry, embracing those who were despised and ostracized. Jesus didn't hang out in palaces or in homes of the great. He was found among ordinary people who knew their own need. That's why when Simeon and Anna saw his parents carrying Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem, they praised God because each saw in this newborn God's salvation. It's why when the Magi arrived, having not found the newborn king they sought in Herod's palace, but rather in a house in Bethlehem, were told that they bowed down and worshipped him. Even as a helpless infant who could only gurgle and cry, they were certain they were seeing God. How do you see him? How do you respond to Jesus? His coming took things to a whole new level. This was no prophet or king. This was God himself. It was a statement that we matter to him. It underlined how far he was prepared to go to bring us back to him. It paved the way for us to become God's friend and find release from sin's curse. And we can't ignore that. The hope of God is that the Magi like the Magi, we would see him for who he really is and worship him as Lord. 
Have you sought him out? Have you found him? Have you discovered him for yourself? Do you see in Jesus Christ your Lord? Maybe this Christmas it's the opportunity to do that. Amen. Now let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, today we want to thank you that Jesus, the Lord, came and entered into our world. He came to where we are. He came among the things that we live among. He came to face the challenges that all we all face ourselves. And in that, he understands us. He knows us. He has a grasp of what we go through. So that when we turn to him, we're not turning to a stranger. We're not turning to one who is ignorant of our circumstances, who has no idea what we're talking about. Thank you that he can totally identify with us. And this morning we praise you and give you the glory and honour and praise that that, that is who we, we remember in the birth of Bethlehem. That is who was here. The Lord God walked among us. And today we pray that you, you will accept the praise and the honour and glory that we give to you for it. Lord, we pray for all who need you to come to them today. We pray for those who are waking up today to discover that the high of last night's party or yesterday's great celebration has faded and that today is just another day and little has changed. Lord, we pray that Jesus born in Bethlehem would be born in their hearts and there that they would discover the most amazing realization of God's love and the fullness of the Spirit. Unbelievably, we come to you again and pray about COVID and another Christmas, praying for a way through it, praying that this illness will be tamed and that we will learn to live with it and to live our lives around it. We pray for those who lead us as we are asked to follow their instructions that you would equip them for this task and that they would embrace their leadership and the decisions that they take with integrity and wisdom. Give them the wisdom that they need and the ability to work graciously with one another. We remember those who live in a world suffering from the effects of greed, of poor government and climate change, for whom famine, war, disease, tyranny is a present reality. Lord, it's terrible that in our modern world people have to live under such conditions. And yet we see it in the tensions in Ukraine. We see it in the tensions with China. We see it in the problems that are existing in Ethiopia. We see it in other places around the world. May the coming years see the change that is required that can only come when you work in our hearts, that we're demonstrating we're not able to manufacture ourselves. And may you help us as your people to step up as caretakers of your creation, that we would look after the world that we would live in, not only the people of it, but the climate and the environment of it. We pray for those who are struggling with mental illness, for whom this time of the year can be particularly challenging. Help them to have the support that they need. And we pray for everyone who needs you to work in their lives today, whether that's for healing from illness or peace in their homes or in their hearts or assurance or direction or release from something. Lord, come to them with your full knowledge of their lives, with the full knowledge that you possess of the world in which they live because you have lived in it yourself, and bring your power and might to them. And in a few moments, quietness, we, 
we name those who need such help today. And hear us, O God, as we pray these things in Jesus' name, who taught us that when we pray together, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Words written about Jesus, the word become flesh. And they're in our final song this morning. Hark! The herald angels sing. And the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore.
Amen.